Back in the day, the world of vacuum cleaners was a fairly boring standard affair. The entire market was made up of Henry Hoover clones, and most consumers barely gave a second thought to the type of vacuum cleaner they bought. Well, that was until Dyson unveiled the DC-01. I mean, check this bad boy out. It was the Lamborghini Diablo of vacuum cleaners when it first turned up on the scene, except that unlike the Diablo, normal people could afford it and they sold like hotcakes. Within 18 months of the DC-01's launch, it took over 47% of the upright vacuum cleaner market. The fact that such a boring industry could be revolutionized by a small Wiltshire-based company was amazing. But enough about Hoovers, remember when it was announced in 2017 that Dyson was going to go all in on developing an EV? When the news was dropped at first, the reception was mixed to say the least. Why would I buy a car from the Hoover people? Why don't they stick to what they're good at, which is, oh, it's really well-engineered electric motor-based products. Ah, well, the industry already knew Dyson was serious about this kind of thing, especially since they bought out a solid-state battery company in Michigan for around $90 million in 2015. But the details at the time were incredibly sparse around the project to say the least. Price? No idea. Body type? Who knows? What does it look like? Even Dyson didn't know at the time. Unsurprisingly, this left the media questioning exactly how far or how serious this whole endeavour was going to be. Of course, there are some huge differences to overcome between designing a vacuum cleaner and a full-on car, but as strange as it sounds, Dyson clearly understood how to get powerful electric motors to work off of small batteries. This experience, paired with Dyson's CEO James Dyson having a strong distaste for the emissions put out by internal combustion engine vehicles, drove him into the automotive industry head first. Several years before they started uh, working on the EV, there were some other attempts. I think he came up with like a cyclone exhaust invention, but was turned away. So anyway, this was his first serious entry into the automotive market. They went ham on buying up top tier talent and amazing facilities. With a seemingly endless R&D budget, it really looked as if Dyson might just manage to crack into one of the toughest, most expensive industries in the world. Two billion pounds worth of investment, a team of 500 engineers, and some pretty astonishing engineering feats went into putting James Dyson's electric dream together. Oh, and they also hired Ian Minards as their global product development director, who in the past has worked with Jaguar and Aston Martin, even helping with developing the beautiful DB11. As with many of their other products, they tried not to just pull a load of existing parts and put them together lazily in Lego style. They really wanted to make this thing from the ground up, or at least as much as possible. Of course, they did need to bring in some other manufacturers, otherwise the car would have had a price tag of half a million pounds. This decision to make so much of the car from scratch, although impressive, was a confusing move from a company of this size who had no experience in manufacturing or designing cars. Sure, two and a half bit billion pounds sounds like a big budget, but when you consider the fact that VW threw about 50 billion at the same type of product and still ended up having to basically do a collab with Ford for EV technology, it's easy to see how opting for developing all of their own components from scratch is just making the products less likely to work. The Dyson electric car's main focus was into designing the car as a platform, similar to how other automakers do. This would have enabled them to offer a range of body styles over the years without needing to reinvent the wheel each time. Initially, they opted for an SUV model. It's increasingly becoming the body type of choice for British families, mainly due to raised ground clearance and a good road presence. There's also the perception of increased safety which comes from driving an SUV, which I think makes a lot of families opt for them. Despite their setbacks, the car was quickly going from just a bunch of CAD files to an actual working prototype. They had even got their plans for a factory done, as well as working out their supply chain and even where they were going to sell the things. I mean, this is about as close to done as you could imagine. It looked like Dyson really were going to dive headfirst into the EV space. Unfortunately, it wasn't just plain sailing for the company, especially given their day jobs. Remember, this was still a vacuum cleaner slash fan slash hand dryer slash headphone 
air purifier company first, and making cars was just their side hustle. Dyson executives were finding it difficult to balance the books on both the money-making side and James Dyson's new project. Initially, the car was supposed to be unveiled in and around 2020, but this date ended up needing to be pushed back to 2021, and the problems Dyson faced extended beyond just the design side of things. I think as most industry experts expected, they did actually manage to pull together a decent working prototype, but the numbers just weren't numbering. The costs were becoming astronomical and eating into the business's day-to-day -day operations. Additionally, I'm sure it wouldn't come as a surprise if I described James Dyson as an eccentric genius, but also a perfectionist, perhaps to his own detriment. Minor, almost trivial tweaks were beginning to eat away at the already ambitious completion date, and pressure began to build. The setbacks from design tweaks, the stress of effectively balancing two businesses on the same books, the complications which came from trying to do it all from the ground up, the limited budget of around £2 billion, and the fact that Dyson had never made a car, let alone a state-of-the-art electric one, all eventually combined into a big mess and forced the project to come to a stop. Think of it this way, it's reported that the designers who were matching the company's culture and ethos became so obsessed with minor, perhaps inconsequential details around design, which led to some of the more basic fundamental problems being overlooked. There was also the Singapore issue. Now, everyone knows that the UK can be a prohibitively expensive place these days to manufacture things, but opting to instead set up manufacturing on a tiny island with 5.6 million or so residents, and an astoundingly high cost of land and wages seemed like a downright baffling decision. I cannot begin to understand this personally as someone who's lived in Singapore in the past. The population density is very high, and there is constantly a fight for space through reclaimed land, a little bit like Dubai. The idea of setting up manufacturing there seems ludicrous. And sure, Dyson has moved their base to Singapore, which is understandable, but it's not necessary to manufacture products in the same country as where the HQ is located. Even Dyson knows this already, since whilst they were based in the UK, much of their products were made in China and Malaysia. Especially considering the fact that much of their supply was all being sourced from Malaysia for this car, that was where they were basing their supply chain from. Surely it would have made more sense to manufacture the cars there too. There must be some kind of reason why this wasn't the case, but that's all speculation. Unfortunately, one problem after another left the company with only one option, which was to scrap the project. The 500 or so engineers who'd been working tirelessly on the project were thanked for their efforts, but told that the idea was no longer financially viable. Basically, they did a bit more thinking about just how much it was going to actually cost over the initial two billion, and realized that taking any more of a risk could jeopardize the currently successful home electronics business. It wasn't a risk they were willing to take. When Dyson dove headfirst into trying to get an innovative electric car out to market in 2017, they had a serious edge over most of their competitors. Thanks to their extensive knowledge in the electric motor and battery field, they really did seem like a serious contender, but once VW, Ford, BMW, Mercedes, and all the other major auto manufacturers started to brute force their way into the industry by plowing hundreds of billions of dollars into R&D, it quickly became clear that Dyson weren't going to beat them to it. Sadly, the fate of those 500 engineers was varied. Luckily, many of them found employment elsewhere within the company, whilst many of the contractors were shown the door. I like to think they were shown the door respectfully, I don't mean to suggest they were just kicked out on the spot. James Dyson reportedly wasn't in the office when the announcement to the team of engineers was made, but he put out a staff email announcing what was going on. The Dyson automotive team has developed a fantastic car. They have been ingenious in their approach whilst remaining faithful to our philosophies. However, though we have tried very hard throughout the development process, we simply can no longer see a way to make it commercially viable. So sadly, the failure of Dyson's ambitious plans to break into the automotive sector wasn't failed due to the product itself not working, but it was simply a matter of finances. They just couldn't find a way to make the numbers work.
Part of the reason for this, according to Dyson himself, came down to the number of other auto manufacturers giving them an advantage. He explains on their website how most EVs are sold at a loss, but can be offset against the more profitable internal combustion vehicles. Since Dyson don't have any ICE cars to sell to take advantage of this situation with, they were just left in a situation where even if they took the car public, they would be hemorrhaging money with every sale. Despite the car's release being a failure, I don't think it's necessarily safe to call the project a failure in its entirety. They were able to develop a competitive car on a shoestring budget, which on paper could have been up there with what the biggest established manufacturers could only manage with a 20 times bigger budget.